Cool. So welcome to Fair Use 101. Uh, we, with the panel I attempted but did not succeed, Scott, uh, to try to convince him to title it Fair Use. That word does not mean what you think it means. Yeah. Um, and this partly comes from the fact that, like, Courtney and I have been doing this several years now, talking about copyright stuff. Um, I work on copyright and fandom specifically, so a lot of this stuff comes up at DragonCon. Uh, and people always answer, but isn't it a fair use? And then that's the, statistically the fastest way to give a copyright lawyer a headache, is to ask them that question. Um, so we figured we'd just dedicate an entire panel to it. Uh, I think kind of what we're going to do is Courtney, Courtney, being the academic, uh, Professor Lytle is uh, gonna gonna talk you through uh, some of the like kind of what fair use means. There's four factors that the court thinks about when talking about fair use. Um, so she'll kind of guide you through that. I'll talk about how that applies to stuff that we commonly see uh, fair use invoked on. So things like fan fiction, fandom, cosplay. Um, side note, self promo plug on the table over there where all the name cards are. Uh, I just got off of writing a huge friggin' series of blog posts about exactly this. Uh, so, unfortunately, I have to book it pretty quickly after the end of this panel. Um, and so what I did was I wrote these two things. I printed up these cards, cosplay and copyright and cosplay, or uh, copyright props and armor, also known as you're a statue, Harry. Uh, and on the back of them, they've got QR codes that'll take you straight to the blog posts. So if you ever really got to scratch that itch, hit it up. Uh, the other self-promo. Ask a legal nerd. I'm the canary in the coal mine in my office on this. Um, basically, if you've got any questions about nerd stuff, fandom, copyright, fair use, video games, mods, uh, whatever your fanish heart desires, and you just want some, you, you got something you really want to know about, scan a QR code, bring you to a form, it'll shoot an email into my inbox, and every week or two we will put out a short video answering whatever questions we get that seem like they thematically fit together. So that's my self plug. Okay, we will start with basic, the honest to God 101 in fair use. We're going to start with fair use, as we're talking about it, is a copyright issue. This means we're not talking about trademark fair use, that's a whole different analysis. Trademarks are your brand names, whether you're allowed to put a Coke logo in a um, tasteless painting, um, the answer is no. But that's a different issue, and it's a different analysis, not what we're talking about. We're doing copyright. I do that, otherwise someone goes, well, I saw this Coke thing. I'm like, yes, that's nice, but that's not what we're talking about. So, different p panel. This one is copyright. Copyright, it's your books, it's your paintings, it's your music, it's your movies, it's your costumes, except not. not. Um, it probably should be, but isn't. Seems like it would be, and yet, instead it covers software. That's a different panel, too. Um, Fair use is in the statute. Most copyright law starts out statutory. We actually, if I was really teaching the class, I would start with the Constitution because that's way more interesting to academics. Um, but we're going to start with the statute. Trust me, it's founded in the Constitution. Now we have a statute. The statute basically sets out if you have a copyrightable work, you get all of these exclusive rights to it. No one is allowed to do any of those things, copy it, publish it, perform it, create a derivative work of it. That's the main one we talk about in Distribute here. Distribute it. Distribute it. All of these things. Those are your rights. No one's allowed to do those things if you own the work. We'll call it a book because that's easier. Usually I bring one. Oh, you've got a book. That's like a private that's a book. Notebook. That's okay. It's still a book. That's my novel in progress anyway. I, didn't bring I wish it. I was joking. I didn't bring the textbook that I don't sell anyone. But um, So if I own the work in this, this book, I wrote this book. Actually, I wonder if she has any good secrets in there. Um, we'll read this later after she's gone. But that's got to be a Dragon Con after dark panel. <laughs> Ooh, I'm definitely keeping this. Okay, after the panel, you guys distract her. Cause she's in a rush to get out. I'll just accidentally hang on to this and say, "Oh, don't worry." She found my Meredith. smut fan fiction crap. I'll get it back to you tomorrow. Don't worry. Okay, you guys distract her. She's going to be running late. I'll keep this. Any rate, this is my book. I have written it. I own it. I can do a lot of things with it. The, the rights tell me what rights I have to this work. You guys can't do any of those things, including copy it, including writing a sequel, including writing the screenplay from my apparently juicy novel. Um, you can't do any of those things. I get to do those things. When you do those things, we call it infringement. Unless that infringement is one that Congress thought was probably okay if you did. They carved out a piece saying, okay, 
you don't get to infringe any of those exclusive rights to this juicy book, but what you can do is use it in a couple very particular ways which we think shouldn't be an infringement. And they even listed some very specifically for you. Um, they list, um, st the statute lists a couple meanings which are a couple uses which you're allowed to do. This should be very simple. This should be the absolutely simplest part of the statute. You can use it for criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including making multiple copies for classroom use. Those words are in the statute. Scholarship and research. Well, okay, that sounds pretty straightforward. So if I'm, do, if I'm going to write a commentary, I'm working for the New York Times, I'm writing the literary review of this smutty novel, I can excerpt parts of it, right? That seems okay. Literary cr criticism does that all the time. Okay, so far so good. This, and again, these are the statutory uses, explicitly says if I use this for teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, it's fine. Well, I teach, I use multiple copies for classroom use on a regular basis. Here's the catch. There's actually a case where a professor assigned some excerpts from different writings back when Kinko's still existed, and you, those of you who went to school at that time knew about going down to Kinko's and buying the Kinko's pack. Um, the problem was he got sued and lost because although he was making those for classroom use, he wasn't making any money off of it. Kinko's was charging what they charged a copy. They weren't profit, you know, that, that was it. The court said, well, the professor outsourced this and it became a commercial thing. So apparently the rule is, notwithstanding, it says specifically you can use these for multiple classroom, have multiple copies for classroom use, you have to go to the Xerox machine and make the copies yourself. I'm pretty sure that wasn't really the line Congress meant to draw, but in fair use, even the simple things aren't simple. The other quick example I like to give is research and scholarship is one of the exclusions. One of the, okay, if you're doing research, you can probably make a copy out of that book, you can make a copy out of that article or whatever. At Texaco, there were a whole bunch of scientists doing sciencey stuff, and they had some subscriptions. Any of you who've worked in a big office have seen the magazines going around on the mail list through the office. And some of them flagged articles they wanted, and, and some of them made copies or had their secretaries make coffee or make copies. That time it didn't actually come up, but this was back in the Xerox days, so you know. Um, and they lost too. They were making copies to keep in their own research files because these articles out of scientific journals were relevant to their research. Sounds like research. But they said, oh yes, but lots of different guys read the same magazine and that wasn't fair, but it says research. So even if the statute says you can do it, you may not be able to. And that's the clear part. So after we get past the clear part where what it says apparently isn't what it means, we get to the squishy part. The squishy part is four elements. And the courts very specifically say, and the statute in fact says, you don't, we're not gonna tell you which one of these is most important. You don't necessarily have to meet all four of these. We're just gonna kind of weigh it and see how we feel that day. Okay, litigators sometimes really like squishy law because they can you know, find a way to winnow through and get a good result for their client. I'm a corporate chick. We like to tell our clients whether they can do something or not. Our clients like to stay out of trouble. They're not already in trouble. If you're already in trouble, you talk to litigators. If you're trying to stay out of trouble, you talk to me and I'll say, eh, I don't know. And then I'll bill you for it because I've got four elements, none of which are real clear, all of which get weighed. So the first element is the purpose and character of use. This often is boiled down to whether it's a commercial or a non-commercial work. This is one of the things that I hear a lot of y'all out there in the real world saying, oh, well, but I'm not selling it, so it's okay. Eh. You're not selling it, so that means one of the elements arguably militates in your favor. Remember I said there are four and the courts get to go eh, all the way through it. So just because you're not selling this piece of fan fiction that you've written doesn't mean it's a fair use, okay? It means you're less likely perhaps to get sued by the content owner. You may get away with it, but it's not necessarily a fair use just because you're not selling it. I'm gonna say that one more time because the biggest uh, misunderstanding that I see out in there is that if you're not selling it, it's fair use. That's not the rule. 
If you're not selling it, it might be a fair use, and that does weigh in your favor. But even if you are selling it, it might be a fair use, and even if you're not selling it, it may not be a fair use. The other thing that comes up under this first element is my least favorite part of this and the litigator's most favorite part of this. It's called transformative use. For anyone who is a big fanfic head, uh, the Organization for Transformative Works, who runs a archive of our own, AO3, the big fanfic archive, that's the transformative desk they're talking about. Now, when I teach my students what a derivative work is, when I talk about taking the underlying work and changing it or altering it in some way to make a new work, that's the derivative work. And remember when I said that the right to create derivative works is one of the author's exclusive rights? Well, then I use pretty much the same words to describe what transformative use is. If I take that underlying work and I change it, if I transform it, then it's pr maybe probably okay. Like, but that's making a derivative work. No, it's not, it's transformative use. Well, what's the difference? Hush, quit asking questions. So, it's murky in here. There was a lovely article written, gosh, 30 years ago now by Justice Laval up north of here, very smart judge, very learned academician, and he said, you know, fair use is confusing, this transformative use thing sometimes swallows the whole analysis, but don't worry. Judges get it together, it takes a while for a common law to develop, it's going to get better, it's really, really bad right now, but I promise it's going to get much better. Again, eh, he was wrong. He's really, really smart, but he was just flat wrong. So transformative use is where a lot of the modern cases come up, and that's the first element. Please keep in mind, from a technical statutory standpoint, that's one of four. And it's only part of one of four, but sometimes it's all they talk about, and sometimes the courts let them go with it. Let me get to the end of my little prepared bit here, and we will take questions, I promise. If it's something specific on that that you didn't get, I'll answer it. This is federal. federal. This is all federal. All federal. There is no state copyright law. There is federal copyright law, so well, everywhere is the same. Well, it's for our purposes. Sound recording. For our purposes, there is no there is no state by state fair use. Fair use is set nationwide. Nation. Now, well, we can talk about differences between circuits, but we mm. won't because we only have an hour. Federal. <laughs> we, we, we can. We talk, don't have a week. We could talk about this for a week, and we'd agree on probably sixty percent of it. About. And then we say, no, that's awful. No, that's And stupid. then I'd call you a heretic. Yeah, that's okay. I, and right. she'd be right. <laughs> and I'd call you an infringer. And she'd be right. We, it would work lovely. We thought about staging a fist fight for y'all, <laughs> but it's late in the day. I did a parade this morning with the kids. She's had like 100 panels. Tomorrow is my 100 panel day. So um, we opted against it. We're all Sorry. for it. Maybe next year. Put that in the comments. Say you want to see the fist fight next year, and we'll work on it. Um, okay, that was one element. The second element is, <laughs> we're going to be done. We're getting there. Sometime at seven. You're going to miss your show. Um, second one is the nature of the copyrighted work. This one's fairly easy. If the underlying work is this juicy novel that I'm going to put here out of arm's reach, um, is the juicy novel, that's right in the heart of what copyright's all about. If it's a fact-based article or a fact-based book, like a textbook, a history book, you don't get to own the copyright in the facts, only in your expression. So if this is something like a list of things, you're not going to get much, if any, copyright protection. So if your copyright, if your work is something smack dab in the middle of what copyright's all about, art or a juicy novel, you're going to get the nature of the copyrighted work goes towards the author. If it's something like an encyclopedia that's real factual, that element will go towards the infringer. Third is the amount used. Now, this sounds lovely and, and quantitative, doesn't it? We've had all this mushiness, now it's amount. Oh, we can measure it. Yeah, there's no answer, okay? This is another thing that I hear people saying, oh, well, if you only use, I've heard like- 30 seconds. 30 seconds, 10 pages, 1,000 words. I've heard lots of numbers, mainly from you guys out there. I'm not gonna point, because I don't actually know which ones of you have said this, but you people out there um, have said these things to me. I'm like, that's a really interesting idea, but no, it's completely wrong. Um, sometimes I don't start with the nice, that's an interesting idea. I just cut to the chase and say, no, that's completely wrong. There is no actual bright line rule. We don't know how much is too much. The judge will tell you how much is too much. There's also an element of what you take is relevant. Gerald Ford, um, former president briefly, um, 
was, wrote a really thick memoir. He's actually a fairly impressive guy, notwithstanding his general impression in the media. And he wrote a really long book. Well, okay, he, in that really long book, there was a little bitty chapter on the whole Nixon getting pardoned thing. Those of you who don't know what that is, Google it later, but some of y'all are old enough to remember that. Um, so really, when he wrote this ginormous book, the only thing anyone really wanted to read, I'm sorry, President Ford, but the only thing anyone wanted to read was that bit about pardoning Nixon. So a magazine excerpted that whole chapter and published it before Ford's poor book was even published. <laughs> President Ford did not sell as many books as he intended, but it's because everyone already read the good bits. You know, the juicy bits in Meredith's story, we might still want to read the other stuff, but it's really once she's back alone on the ship with the pirate that we're interested, right? So I'm more interested in your version of my book than my own book at this point. <laughs> I just want to see where this goes. Hey, we can talk about joint works. That's a different panel. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so not only can you not take too much, and we don't know how much that is till the judge tells us, you can't take the really good bits. Don't steal Ford's only really interesting chapter. Historians were interested in the rest of it. Historians just don't buy enough books to pay the mortgage. Everyone else would have bought the book except that this magazine published it first and just the good juicy bits. That's the third factor. The fourth factor is the effect on the market. Now here's where transformative use also comes back in, and I even think in an appropriate way. If what you've done to this work is going to replace the market for the original book, the original work, then it's going to work against the infringer. If you write a adaptation of her juicy novel that's really the same thing, just done slightly differently, you might buy that one instead of this one. If you added some really kind of adult pictures to go along with it and made it a graphic novel, and I mean graphic novel, <laughs> then that might sell a lot more even than her original would have. That I'll would supplant the market and that would not be okay. An example that's okay is um, Google sometimes has little thumbnails when you pull things up and it gives you little bitty pictures of something and they said that having a copy in this little bitty thumbnail picture of a big portrait of something is fine because the little bitty thumbnail Okay, it reproduces the whole piece of art, but no one who wants to buy a big piece of art to hang on their wall will think that that little bitty thumbnail is any sort of replacement. So it's not, it is, you know, copying the entire thing, everything on there would work against it, but they got to the fourth factor and said, but seriously, it doesn't matter. So that's a fair use. Three out of four factors went against the infringer, it still wasn't fair use. Now, I'm hoping you bristled a little bit each time I call these people infringers, but they are infringers. This is the one thing to understand about fair use, is that until the judge tells you your use was fair, that's how we actually get the phrase, fair use, the use was fair or allowed, it's an infringement. Fair use is a defense to an action for an infringement. Now, if, it, if the use is indeed fair, then you weren't infringing. And I'm being kind of obnoxious by calling them infringers out front, because you're really not an infringer until the judge says so either. But we know that they are. But so the, you can't walk around talking about an affirmative right to fair use. You have an affirmative right to free speech, but fair use is a defense to an action for infringement. That's where it comes up. And that's something that people also tend to kind of forget. The reality is in a lot of cases, and this is me being a corporate attorney, if you're an artist, if you're a startup company, unless you're a big company with some of our people like on staff or a big budget for litigation, it costs you an awful lot of money to get to the point the judge says what you did was okay. And keep that in mind. You may be right. Your use may be absolutely within the fair use statute and you are allowed to do that. But if the content owner objects and has deep pockets enough to go to court, it's going to cost you a lot of money to prove that you're allowed to do what you're doing. Yeah, so to piggyback on that, um, I come from policy perspective. So I don't litigate cases. That's the good folks at EFF do a lot of direct mm -hmm. litigation. I, we at Public Knowledge do not. We just know things. We drink and we know things. That's kind of our job. Um, it's a good job. It's not a, I wish there was more drinking and less knowing things. But uh, yeah, so a couple of things to keep in mind. One, as Courtney pointed out, as a practical matter, fair use you only get to decide if something is a fair use when you're already in front of a judge, okay? Which means you've already gotten sued, which means you've already all made it all the way into a courtroom. 
So it's usually not a safe thing to rely upon unless you are very clearly doing something that a court has some already adjudicated to be fair use. Uh, that's a hard thing to do because point number two, fair use kind of amounts to just a sniff test. Mm -hmm. um, it's purposely very vague and the idea is it's an I know it when I see it. Uh, because copyright covers a huge and frankly ever-growing swath of kinds of works. Uh, and the upshot is that the law cannot account for the full spectrum of human creativity. And so to some extent, you're going to have to leave a case-by-case -case determination to someone to actually suss it all out. Mm -hmm. And that someone is going to be a judge. Uh, and the upshot of this is, you know, one of the nice things about this being kind of squishy is a judge can look at something and go like, you know, he can look at a, a thumbnail and go, literally no one is going to use this instead of going out and buying a poster. So even though it meets the letter of the law for infringement, maybe it isn't. The flip side is every judge then suddenly thinks they're a literary critic uh, and decides that they are going to go down the thematic rabbit holes of Catcher in the Rye oh, versus, God. you know, whatever the fuck else. I don't even remember what the book was in there. Um, it was There was like a follow-up. Someone wrote a follow-up to Catcher in the Rye and the Salinger estate sued for it. Um, point three, and this is where my policy bent comes in. Uh, copyright is a very old system, it's fundamental, and this is a history lesson for another day. Copyright was premised on protecting publishers. It was not premised on protecting authors. Um, if you go all the way back historically to the Statute of Anne, which was a British statute in the 17th century? Um, yeah. Uh, so 1600s. 1607, I think. That sounds right. Something like that. Um, so early 17th century, Statute of Anne was essentially the first copyright that we understand it to be, and it granted the right to publishing houses to be right. able to print particular books. Uh, the history of copyright since then has been major publishing industries in which publish whatever format you choose, book publishers, music publishers, movie studios, getting together, and every time copyright law is revised, it is literally those industries just sitting around a table making deals with each other. And that's how we get copyright law updates. And I could go off on a whole other friggin' solo panel about that. I have a canned 35-minute, very profanity-laced rant about this. But the reality is that, one, we haven't had a major update to copyright law since the 1970s. Uh, two, that's a can of worms that literally everyone on both sides is afraid to crack. Yes. Uh, it is, it's a good, the bad, and the ugly standoff at this point between tech and content industries and consumer advocates. We're all just staring at each other very nervously. Going, uh, I don't want to go there. And three, yeah, literally no one wants to know what will happen. Uh, and so the, the end of this is that fair use ends up being a safety valve for a whole lot of very, very common behaviors that mm -hmm. consumers engage in when they interact with copyrighted media. Um, it's a safety valve because copyright law does not contemplate things like two screening television shows, does not contemplate gifting. It certainly fucking did not contemplate cosplay, uh, though it, like, temporally would have, you know, cosplay existed the last time we revised copyright law, but it was at, like, a handful of very scattered, like, Star Trek conventions, essentially. Yeah. It was not mainstream. Didn't cover fan fiction. Didn't consider, certainly, vidding. It didn't, it certainly didn't contemplate the friggin' Return to Axonar movie uh, that, you know, caused a small tsunami uh, of copyright litigation. Uh, none of this stuff was ever envisioned, and so we're kind of, we've just, you know, Congress and, frankly, advocates, I'm, I am part of the problem on this, is, like, we don't want to, we don't actually want to rewrite the statute, because, like, that's the road to terrible outcomes, and so we kick to the courts, and we say, like, it's your problem now. You guys figure it out, case-by-case -case basis. If something gets bad enough, we, like, we'll all come in and file briefs about why it should come out the way it is. Um, but that's kind of where fair use exists right now. Um, so... Having said all of that... Let me add one thing in there before you go yeah, on to the next part. Absolutely. Um, keep in mind, one of the issues here is fair use was put in exactly like Meredith said, so that people can do the stuff that we know ought to be okay. You ought to be able to quote it in a review. You ought to be able to use it in your... Re you know, make a copy of it in your research file. You ought to be able to do all these things. Remember, the copyright law was written in the late 70s. We had Xerox machines. Nothing was digital. People wrote fan fiction back then, but they shared it with people they actually knew. There were no Facebook friends, there were only actual friends. And, you know, it had to be the number of people you knew within a reasonable distance of your home who wanted to read your Star Trek script. Well, that's, now, that's a little unfair because there were zines at that point. I mean, there was like there a was mailing some, distribution but it was still, of it. But it's not the scale that we yeah. You had to subscribe. I mean, I will confess 
that a friend and I wrote a absolutely hysterical Star Trek parody script, and our friends all read it. That was a dozen people, maybe, and we performed it at a party one night, and it was high school. We weren't even drunk. It was hysterical nonetheless, but no one else ever knew about it. I'm sure, high school famous. I'm sure if Roddenberry knew about it, he would have loved it because it was brilliant. Um, but no one knew about it, so no one cared. We couldn't put it on the internet where a million of our friends could find out how brilliant we are because there was no easy, fast, and free distribution. So the whole fact that fan fiction now can become relevant and can turn into <coughs> Twilight, um, actual money-making processes the content people are more concerned, but more relevantly, they're more aware of it. And they care more when it starts to infringe. Some of them are smart enough to know that if we're busy writing Star Trek scripts, we're waiting for the next movie. No matter how bad it gets, we're still going to go because we're busy staying excited about it. And this is the last thing I will add before I want to like kick it out to questions because okay. there's like always a million questions about this. Um, so I wrote about this in my blogs, which you should all go read. They're brilliant. Uh, traffic to my website. Um, no, so here's the thing. Uh, cosplay, uh, cosplay is kind of a weird situation because clothing is not subject to copyright. That's a general matter. This is a very long, and there's a whole other friggin... We did a panel on We that. did a panel on that two years in a row. Um, the short version is that things like cosplay and prop making... We're, we live in an age right now, and this is a very historically specific moment, where major rights holders, like the mouse... Um, and yes, I say that with all the venom I can muster as a copyright advocate. I'm going to Disney uh, November. The, the companies look at this, and they have realized that, for one thing, all this fan activity, or fan act, uh, has busted into the mainstream pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very visible, and it's free advertising, as far as they care. Uh, and we live in an era of communications where, if they decide to slap someone with a lawsuit it's going to get out and it's going to get out fast and it's not a it, there's nothing legally holding them back from suing fans for most things and this includes cosplay yeah. it's pr that holds them back um now there's a debate about whether that is how the law should be uh and that's a good debate to have and like my got my own two cents on it which is like no there should be some affirmative protections built in for a lot of these things it is, does not require you to first get in front of a judge to figure out whether or not you can avail yourself of them um but, you know, the kind of depressing reality is that a lot of this stuff, it's, as far as the letter of the law is concerned, is not kosher. Um, it just ends up being fine because no one's going to call you on it. Uh, and so on that extremely depressing note, uh, I kind of want to open it up to questions, hopefully some of which will have happier answers so we don't all leave angry at me. We can make up some stuff that's happy right at the end. Yeah, there we go. They won't know the difference. Just say it like you I'll mean spoil it. the ending of my okay, book. Okay, excellent. The ending is the really just Oh, this is a microphone. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I Recently I heard that there was some kerfluffle about memes over in Europe. Do you think that's going to uh, impact uh, how the internet does things like how in Europe uh, d recently did their digital rights thing? So um, a couple of couple of points. One, um, I actually I don't know the specific case that you're talking about. Yeah, I, um, I do know that there have been instances where um, I think it was like socially awkward penguin was one where the guy who and if you haven't seen this meme, it's a penguin looking awkward, and then you put captions on it about <laughs> socially awkward things happening, like say hi, nice to meet you. She says we've met before, like those kinds of things. Um, but there's a picture of a penguin, and the guy who took the photo of the penguin found out that this had become a meme and that he wasn't making any money off of it and got pissed and started suing people for using the meme. Um, which is, you know, okay, fine. Again, this is one of those cases where, like, 1978 Congress never saw this one coming. Like, I think pretty confidently they did not realize we'd have a global sci-fi communications network in which we sent pictures of our cats to each other. Like, that was not in anyone's brain. Except maybe Ron Wyden. He was probably thinking of it. Um, but... Uh, you know, so this is like, the answer is that most of the time this kind of stuff is going to be fair use. And actually this is kind of this weird sort of, in trademark we call it genericide. It's when you become a victim of your own success, yeah. basically. Um, so if you think about like, I have a tissue. Do we call this a tissue or do we call it a Kleenex? Kleenex call... would like you to call it a Kleenex brand tissue. Right. Because Kleenex is a brand name. But after a certain point, I mean, we're down in the south. 
people ask you, do you want a Coke? And then they ask you, what kind of Coke do you want? You want a Coke or a Pepsi? Like, that's, pff, that blows my mind. No um, one in Atlanta would ever say that. That's true. It would just be Coke. Um, and if you want a Pepsi, we're going to look at you funny and make you feel uncomfortable so you leave. I'm from New Jersey. Uh, so you can drink Pepsi up there. We understand. You don't know better. I'm Pepsi swigging liberal. What can I say? Um, yeah, so, you know, the point is that there are certain brand names that it's become synonymous, like Band-Aid. Like, Band-Aid is a brand. That is specifically a brand. It is an adhesive bandage. If you ever look at the store brands, and they, like, find all these weird verbiage to get around the brand name. Um, so that's the concept of genericide. It's like homicide, but with a... a if you're, yeah, it's your trademark it becomes generic by virtue of its own success. Escalator, aspirin. Those aspirin. were all brand names. They're um, now the name of the noun. But and, the first company that made them, that was their brand name for it. It was Bayer Aspirin, I think, was the first. But Aspirin, Ele Escalator, and um, Refrigerator. And so there is a point. The point of this is, like, the law is aware. The law has a concept baked into it, albeit in a slightly adjacent area of law, that when something becomes so successful and so commonplace, you kind of lose the ability to rein it in anymore. Um, and memes are an interesting case on this. Uh, there is, I mean, so the guy who created Pepe the Frog, Matt Fury, is sort of the like really sympathetic use case for this, because um, he was he, his creation got co-opted by neo Nazis. Like that's, I no one envies him this. Um, having said that, he's kind of gone on a copyright crusade to sort of take it down. And there's a there's a legitimate question about like, do you really meaningfully own it anymore after it's been thrown around the internet that? much and if you're a creator that is a nightmare scenario that's the kind of thing that keeps yeah. you up at night um can you literally be a victim of your own success um and so i think you know i think the end point of this is that memes are like kind of that interesting we you know if you're in law school that's the kind of thing you put on the final exam just to watch how your students score when they have to think about I it love writing exam questions um so yeah i i don't know the specific case so i can't give you a hard answer on it but i think you know that's that's an interesting question um and one that is like kind of gets at the core of like how the internet impacts copyright i do want to kind of put in real quickly the counterpoint to some of what she was saying there's the one argument that's oh it's so broad everyone's already using it well just because you stole it from me and then lots of other people stole it from me doesn't mean it was wrong to steal it from me in the first place. And that's kind of the opposite argument. Both of these arguments are made by people who truly mean it. There is a real famous quote from Lawrence Lessig from 2008 in an interview where he said, well, all of the young kids are stealing and he didn't say stealing, of course, are using and transforming and you know, think they have a right to use existing work to transform into their own works. So it's silly to make it illegal. And some people can say, well, yeah, everyone's doing it. Now, I'm a mother. You know what your mother said about everyone's doing it. What follows that? Something about bridges. Yeah, it involves bridges. There's one about cows, but that's when you're older. Um, but so it's, yeah, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you? So I don't care if everyone's stealing. It's still not okay. And that's kind of the counterpoint argument. And there's merit on both sides, but no, there's not. Um, <laughs> yes, who has a, who's got the ball? Got there the we box. go. Um, I just wanted to kind of add on a little point to what you guys were saying earlier about the um, about things kind of spreading onto YouTube and like YouTube or um, copyright kind of already adjusting to it. Uh, there was a huge kerfuffle about uh, H3 Productions not too long ago doing a reaction video, and the guy who made this like really 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 bad parkour video like took them to court, mm -hmm. went all the way up to Supreme Court, and they like finally got acknowledgement that like reaction videos are now a thing and that is fair use along with um let's play videos where uh, a bunch of uh, um, production companies are realizing like this is a good way to advertise our product mm -hmm. like it originally started with um pewdiepie and uh flat oh, yeah. but now people are getting like copies of breath of the wild early just so they could watch them play video games yeah the let's play ones are interesting um because i know that has been like so this is the other thing you have to keep in mind copyright is very much a sword for non-copyright issues people use it's the one you have a hammer everything looks like a nail kind of problem um people use copyright to achieve all different it's just sarah jong if you haven't read the book the internet of garbage it's a phenomenal book um and it kind of it has a section on copyright and this sort of idea that like thanks to the sort of litigation success, and I'm going to put success in scare quotes, of the RIAA in the early aughts and the Napster lawsuits, like culturally we've sort of ingested this idea that copyright is just how you get things erased from the web um, for all kinds of reasons, whatever they happen to be. So, you know, copyright ends up being uh, used for a lot of uh, revenge porn. 
or hacked porn um, because it's the only tool available to yeah. the people and to the women in the photo. Overwhelmingly women, not always. Um, it is used, there's a very famous case, Google v. Garcia, uh, which went all the way up to SCOTUS, Supreme Court, uh, which basically what happened in this was this woman answered an ad for an acting job. She was supposed to be in this historical drama about the Prophet Muhammad. Now, that should have sent up a red flag somewhere, but it didn't. So she showed up. She got paid like 50 bucks. She said two totally innocuous lines, went home, went out about with her life. Some months or a year later, the video goes up on YouTube. Her voice has been overdubbed to say something insulting about the Prophet Muhammad. Turns out the entire thing is this, like, incendiary like Islamist baiting video uh, about how like how the prophet was a child like a pedophile and da, 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 da. the whole thing is just like deliberately incendiary and she starts getting death threats because she's in it. Um, now she tries to get YouTube to pull the video by claiming she has a copyright in her performance, which was for all of thirty seconds in this thing, and there's this whole line winding legal road and there's a, there's an axiom in that you learn in law school that says hard cases make bad law which is that occasionally you have situations where like you really want to help this person but this law is not how you do it um and you know all your instincts are that justice is served by x outcome but the letter of the law says you have to do not x uh and so part of this was you know at one point a judge said like yes you have a copyright in your performance despite the fact that the exact letter of the law says you do not uh and so this got bandied about a lot um and basically, like, I guess the, the you know, Let's Plays are interesting because I've seen people try to take them down based on, like, really bad reviews of some of their really shitty video games. People have tried to take them down. Um, and so it is interesting. I think you're right. I think generally, like, industry and the video game industry has had some time. Music was the canary in the coal mine. They were the first ones to have to deal with this on a real massive scale. And they did it wrong. And they did it wrong. So wrong. So very wrong. Uh Video games have been able to kind of sit back and sort of watch this unfold, and that's how you get, like, the Valve Corporation, which is, like, the embodiment of best practices in a lot of ways. Um, and they are able to just harness this. They're like, look, this is what people do. Like, we just got to roll with it. Uh, like, how do we make money off of what people already enjoy doing? So, yeah. Which is fine, but it doesn't change the law. It doesn't change the law. The it just law changes the practice. you still can't do that. But things like the, you know, I'm going to play this video and let you watch me play it, and I'm going to say things about it, that's arguably under a fair use thing, but you're doing the whole game. Usually, like we were saying, the games don't mind because it's publicity. People are explicitly not buying the game because they can watch a Let's Play. Yeah. Like, duh. Doesn't really replace it. But yeah. when they've had a few where the guys were saying really offensive stuff, not just it's a bad, not just the game sucks, but they were making white supremacist remarks and things like that, then suddenly the game company said, wait a minute, Please you stop. can't use our game with that because we don't want to be associated How do we make with stop? the filth you're spewing. They look at their in-house counsel. How do we make them stop? And uh, they said, well, copyright? copyright law. And more suits are brought. Yeah. Okay, who's got the box? So I have a question. Um, it sort of relates to with Shepard Ferry and what he had to go <laughs> through with the Associated, uh, Associated Press. And how exactly can they say that this one tiny piece of the photo that he took and he transformed it massively. He took the whole but, photo. But he, they took his face from the thing and then they... He changed it in, so, in a way that it wasn't the same thing. How, because I play a video game and we make logos based on little icons that are from our game from two sides. And I want to know how much do I have to transform that logo to something else before I can't get in trouble for infringing on copyright. You've got some of your facts wrong in the Shepard Ferry case. He took the um, Manny Garcia's photograph and Colorized. I mean, he made it look very different, but he took the photograph. It was the whole photo. It was the he whole did, photo, yeah. and it was this was one of those stupid moments. Here's the other lesson for copyright: ask permission. This was a mm. this was an AP photograph. They licensed those. They would have licensed this for a small amount of money. Shepard Ferry, who is a very frequent consumer of the legal process, usually suing people for infringing his works. I do not like that man. Um, he took this. He took someone's photograph and used it and yeah he transformed it to an extent he took the whole photo he used it in a way that people normally pay for and then he claimed no it was okay and he settled there was not a ruling in that one he settled before it got there and then he sued some other people for um, putting it on t-shirts but um, if you're trying to change something to use it in a logo honestly you're much better off making a new logo 
don't change other people's <coughs> stuff to use it. Create something new, and then you won't get sued. Don't yeah, try so to figure out how much I, you have to change, because there, as we've been saying all along, there's not an answer to that. I and will say there is, there is okay, so the, the general response is usually just like make your own and roll with it. I, this comes up a lot in music with sampling. People are like, well, why do you sample? Why don't you just make your own? Like, why don't you just be creative? Da, 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 da. Okay, it's, it's not that simple for one thing, obviously. Um, two, it's the entire category of fan works is based on repurposing and transforming right. extant works. Um, but she's talking about a commercial use for making logos, I think, right? It's, we have two different teams that have two different symbols that represent us, and then for each city that we live in for our different teams, we mm -hmm. repurpose the, whatever our team's logo is to, for like, we will put in part of like, we in Seattle, they use part of this needle if within the logo. If you're changing your own logo, then oh, it's then fine, because yeah, you own it. You own no, no, it. You can it, change it, any way you want. And this is trademark, by the way, if it's logos, but it's still the same idea. If you're taking someone else's logo and incorporating it into your own, you can't do that. If you're, um, and this is all commercial use, so it's not going to work for you. The result's going to be bad for you. If it's your own thing that you're taking and changing, well, yeah, that's fine. It's yours. You can do what you want. Okay. Also, I'm just going to generally wave to the thing that says, like, we're not lawyers. Yes. We're not your lawyers, This is not legal advice, but <laughs> who's hey, got the box? Um, so one thing you mentioned is that the legal process to defend fair use is expensive for a lot of people, mm -hmm. and but also that uh, creating legislature around it is, is difficult. So a lot of times, like single case judges is, is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Is there? Do you, do you guys see there's like a solution to this? Like, is there a way f to have case by case judging without a very expensive process for a lot of people? Um, there have been a. Uh, not within our legal I, system as it exists. Yeah, as it exists, no. If you wanted to completely I restructure wish. everything, we could come up with a way, and it may involve arm wrestling, but it could be done, but not in our current system. I mean, the legislature you know, requires, a, I'd say, an act of Congress to move, but that's kind of a little bit redundant. Um, judges are random and expensive and hard to get to, and there's not a better option. I mean, troops of ninjas, maybe? But within our existing legal system, no. There's a box. We were, we're a slave to the box. All right. So, so uh, his attention for the question. Just to clarify on the, uh, the first person's point about that particular case that was brought up in Europe, um, it's actually not something that has been put into place yet. It's a proposed thing that's being uh, – European lawmakers are trying to uh, impose a system of uh, – like an algorithm on social media sites that will monitor uh, memes and other things that are posted. And if the meme contains a copyrighted image, okay. like let's say it's a meme of Shrek, for example, then it would get taken down. Um, but it hasn't been put through yet. So just to clarify that. Okay, so that's the Article 13 Copyright Directive, uh, I think is the technical name of it. It's, their, it's the proposed copyright directive that they're kind of still figuring out. Yeah. yeah, something like that. I think that. that's right. So uh -huh. I haven't followed that closely, so that's my disclaimer on this, and I'm not a European copyright expert. Yeah, no, 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 no. My broad understanding, though, is because I do, do internet policy. Um, the dream scenario for major rights holders, so again, this is publishing houses, this is not necessarily musicians or authors. Although it's um, also them. It is, it is some of them, but not all. Um, I think there's a lot more variety of opinion there. Uh, the dream scenario if you're a major content holder is that you have these kinds of filters in place. This, it's this idea of notice and stay down or notice and keep down is the, is the term that they kind of bandy about. Um, currently, the way the law generally works, uh, it definitely in the US, I think there's an analog in Europe, is that if you are a web host, if I run a website and someone comes and uploads some stuff to my website and there's copyright infringement in it, the rights holder then has to notify me and say, hey, that thing right there that's infringing my copyrights, you got to take it down. Yeah. And then I have to go through and take it down. And then there's a whole back and forth process if the person who uploaded it says, no, I want that back up. And then I step out and I'm like, y'all take this to court. I don't want to be involved. Um, that is, uh, to rights holders, they consider that very burdensome mm -hmm. uh, because it requires them to basically affirmatively monitor for their work showing up in places. And they would rather shift that burden to the platform to do the monitoring. Yeah. We all like to outsource our jobs. Right. They would like to outsource their responsibilities. And there is an argument that like small musicians specifically like don't have the, and photographers are notoriously photographers especially. overstrapped and they can't, you know, they basically are kind of required to hire a service to do this for them. And that's an extra cost they want to have to do. And there, are, there's a debate about like whether they, it's like tough. That's part of doing business. Um, 
And so the ideal scenario, if you're a major rights holder, is to ship that burden onto the platforms. And now, article the the copyright directive that they're thir- currently thinking about in the EU would shift that burden onto platforms to affirmatively, like, mi- like literally take a magnifying glass to everything that gets uploaded to them mm-hmm. and say, uh, does this look like copyright infringement or not? Now, the problem is, if it is copyright infringement and they guess wrong, then they're legally liable. That's a problem. And so what that does is that creates incentives for them to overcorrect right. and basically say, well, this looks kind of maybe sort of like fair use, but I don't trust it. Off it goes. Yeah, uh, and they chuck won't get in the... trouble for taking something down they shouldn't have because you don't actually have any right to put something on the internet. Right. So they And so they're always going to err on the side of, might be a problem, Everybody's get away from it. Out. Plus the in-house lawyers, of which I used to be one, are going to say, ooh, that might be a problem. Let's don't do it. And They're going to err on the side of caution for them, which is basically chilling consumer speech on the it's like users won't have the freedom to upload stuff as much the other option and you can actually see this so i don't know if you guys follow wikimedia's blog um there's a german professor who just recently did a really interesting experiment where he took sound recordings of classical music that are in the public domain in germany and he uploaded them to german youtube and he waited to see how long it took him to get a copyright takedown notice now these these are sound recordings of works everything about these things is in the public domain and someone would invariably, I think, I think the record was like 24 hours, and oh, every single one of them came down, um, or got taken down by an automated notice. And he was like, he's going, like this, is, this is Google, this is the biggest company in the history of mankind, and they haven't managed to create a copyright filter that correctly figures out that this is a public domain sound recording. So for one, the kind of two things. One, algorithms are notoriously bad at identifying works in the first place, uh, because if you're a computer, all you got to look at are bits and bytes. Uh, and so classical music is particularly weird because different recordings of the same piece of classical music from a mathematical perspective are very similar to each other. Um, and so a public domain sound recording of a Wagner movement is going to sound pretty close to a, a copyrighted recording of that same movement. Um, with Copyright, you can have a copyright in the composition. Wagner stuff is long since the public domain. If you made a sound recording of it, you can have a copyright separate. in that sound recording that is separate right. from the composition. So even though all of Wagner's in the public domain, a sound recording, a performance that was recorded right. of it made 50 years ago in Germany, I think, would now be public domain. But one made last week would still be under copyright. And so, so you would have to know when that recording was made. And apparently even Google can't do that. Yeah. And that's it a, knows everything I've ever Because it, ma- it tries to match to things that's already in its database. And what's in its database is stuff that rights holders have submitted. So that's the basis that yeah. they're working off. So it's the old, like, you know, the uh, machine learning thing, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Like, it's all copyrighted stuff in. It's all going to be copyrighted stuff coming out the other end. So it's not um, ready yet, apparently. And the flip side, yeah, so first off, this is Google. If Google can't friggin' do it, do I don't it know yet. how they expect the old joke, just nerd harder. Like, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> you cannot just nerd harder to solve the world's problems. Um, Elon Musk harder. literally needs to get that memo. But um, the second, yeah, I will dunk on Elon Musk. You've all been warned. Um, point two is that, that algorithms are, algorithms just cannot do fair use. Like, we were just talking about how this whole thing is squishy. It's, it's a totally subjective human judgment call. Um, and so, essentially, all this incentivizes companies to do is either, you know, create an algorithm that's going to overcorrect or just say, like, fair use is not a thing anymore as a functional matter because an algorithm is just always going to take it down. Um, so that's the big problem with, with that whole schema that, like, the EU copyright directive kind of embodies. And from people who work from the internet consumer side, we all kind of flip out about this because we're like, well... That's a quick way to shut down everything uh, and break the internet. Yeah. Next box. It's got the cube. Oh. Hi. Um, I work for a nonprofit that puts on symposia. Mm-hmm. And we, it's a scientific nonprofit, and we give the copyright of everybody's paper that they present to that person. Mm-hmm. You don't give we, it to them, it is theirs. But well, they, they, they have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. But we also record their presentation mm-hmm. and we put that up on YouTube. I think in the past, I think, we have gotten releases to, do, to record them, mm-hmm. but I probably need to go back and, and find out if, if we have a release to put it up on YouTube. 
Does that make sense? The best answer in those kinds of situations, I mean, I said it before when Meredith argued with me about it, now she'll agree with me, get permission. Just ask. Tell them, <laughs> say, here's the release you need to sign. We are going to record you. I mean, I still get to put it on Scott YouTube. points this thing at me, and I don't love it, but I do because that's a condition of being on the panel. I was going to say, we got our little, our little advanced notice. This is like the equivalent of the iTunes user agreement over yeah. here. So no one looks at it. They're recording it. <laughs> they're posting it this, and I agreed to it. And so just get all of your, get all of, not performers, but all of your um, presenters. presenters. Just, you, but you need to have a decently worded release saying they acknowledge you're doing these things, they give you the rights to do so. Yep. And that's okay. all you need to do. But cool. they have to agree to it. Otherwise, they can come back and cause you problems, which is the last thing your nonprofit needs. So ask permission, and since these people want to present it on your platform, they'll give it. Probably. And if they don't, well, get someone else to fill the spot. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, I mean, that's not hard, but get permission. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Look, we agree, we agree on one. Yay! Solving the world's problems. Um, Hire a lawyer. You know, a f like how a few years ago there was the uh, uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and how it was, you know, it was a public work, or uh, yeah, a public domain work that mm -hmm. was, you know, transformed. I, I had an idea recently about the parallels between, like, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't write that without it being an academic comparison? Is that a way of fair use? Or I couldn't just an like... An academic paper on that would be fine. But you can't just like release and say like, oh look, uh, you know, releasing like an edition of Hitchhikers like with parallels from the Dante's Divine Not Comedy. without asking Douglas Adams' estate. Probably. Yeah, because... Yeah, you can't reproduce also the that, entire book just by adding margin notes. That has the added complication of he's a British estate and they have slightly different rules. Yeah. Which are a little more restricted than the U.S. Okay, so I, I was, was thinking more about uh, if you would also kind of talk more about like that kind of transformative use of public works. Yeah, so I think the thing to keep in mind is that when you are doing so, like assuming that basically kind of what you're proposing is is a Hitchhiker's Guide with kind of a side by side comparison to Dante's Inferno. Um, at the end of the day, you're still reproducing the entirety of Hitchhiker's Guide, um, and well, that is. Technically under the law, because everything is squishy, that is not in and of itself enough to disqualify a fair use. Like, you could still theoretically have a fair use. That makes it a really, really hard argument. Yeah, I, I don't think you would succeed in a fair use argument in that case. If you just wrote the paper, I wrote a brilliant high school paper comparing Zane Gray and James Finmore Cooper. Brilliant scholarship. Um, no problem. I quoted some of them also. I was in high school, no one cared. But, you know, that sort of thing is perfectly fair game. Even if you published that article comparing the two works, that's fine. It, again, like Mary said, if you reproduce the whole thing, yeah, and yeah you're kind of losing on all four of those elements. Yeah. Um, so I'm a part-time video editor, and mm -hmm. a lot of the videos I make usually, or I usually make a lot of AMVs or other music videos mm -hmm. like that. And from what I understand, that is a basically a minefield when it comes to fair use. Mm -hmm. I've been hit with copyright strikes for both the video and the music I've made. And even though I feel like it's like a transformative work, everyone's... I've, basically heard both sides of the spectrum on that so I just wanted mm -hmm. to get um, kind of your opinion on so are you do you host them on like YouTube I host them on mo mo YouTube mostly yeah. on YouTube okay so there's a couple of different points one there's like the legal status of the fair use claim under that which you're right is it's a my it, that is legitimately like Duh. Um, as with almost all things in fair use, the answer is definitely maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, Can you afford to take it to court? Is yeah. Sometimes the answer. Uh, no. And the second then layer on down. that is the is the notice and takedown process that that and the automated matching that that YouTube specifically uses, which is how they, we were just talking about how you build your algorithm. Yeah. How much does it need of a sample? How much does it need to look like this other thing? And that's al Google's algorithm or YouTube's algorithm is is deliberately secret, um, partly so people can't game it. Uh, which yeah. is okay. That makes sense. That's what we um, do. And because people will game it, yeah. that's how you do things. Um, but the end result is that like the degree of accountability for these sorts of things, and like when you send up account, like I've had stuff, I've had strikes against my YouTube account, um, and I like was a college senior, and I had a strike, and you know I wanted to contest it. They gave me to this really freaking scary looking form that was like. If you get another notice, you must go to court. Um, and I'm sitting there in my pajamas eating Cheetos, and I'm just like, uh, and I don't want to deal with that. So I just never contested it and put it back up. Even yeah. though now I'm a copyright lawyer, I'm looking back and going, that was some bullshit. Like, I should probably have had that one up. Um, you know, and those are a lot of kind of like ancillary arguments. But this is an interesting point because 
what the law is, and this is kind of, I feel like should probably be a, a panel next year. Make a note. Um, <laughs> the difference between the law and the practice. No. Because the practice does not change the law, but it shapes functionally how the law ends up working. Right, um, right now, the great adjudicator of fair use online is not the courts, it's YouTube. Uh, and YouTube's algorithm specifically, and then the handful of people who uh, are ballsy enough to fight it in court and go get EFF or other copyright lawyers to fight it for them. Yeah. Um, I will say one thing. This is another place with some misunderstandings out amongst the real people. Um, there is not some rule about if you get a takedown notice, you have 100 days before they can sue you. There no. are specific back and forths within the DMCA takedown notice process. But usually if you get a cease and desist letter, a lot of people think they have some certain amount of time or you have to wait for the third warning. No. no. The, honestly, a cease and desist letter is just a lawyer's way of being nice and not suing you yet. Yeah. Um, there's, it, there's no rule about how long you have after the cease and desist letter. It's the warning shot across the bow. The next one might smash you to death, or there might be three more warnings. There's no rule, so don't rely on You're at their mercy at that point. I got the first cease and desist letter, so that means I, I listen to these things like, that's interesting. Just call a lawyer. And the lawyer will say, well, do you want to fight it or do you want to cave in? And that's how much justice can you afford? I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so, what, we got the cube. what changes would you like to see to the statute law? So here's my fever dream. And Courtney's Court going to call me a crazy person for this. Um, She's a crazy person. They're just get it right out of there. No, um, saving time. I would like to see fair use be what we, in, as lawyers, call a rebuttable presumption. Which is what me what that means is when rebuttable presumptions are when you show up at the court and the court says, All right, unless someone proves otherwise, we're gonna assume this set of factors is true. It's the opposite right now. Right. So right now if you get accused of copyright infringement and your defense is fair use, you're the one who has to show up and prove all four of those factors for fair use. In my just our narco fever dream copyright world, um, Fair use would be presumed from the get-go, probably with a couple of caveats, like if you're not making money off of it, you know, like in the absence of monetization, the court has to presume that it's fair use. And then it's up to the rights holder to prove that it's not. Um, because that shifts the burden back to the parties that can bear it in most cases um, and would actually level the playing field and would level access, frankly, for, you know, people getting dragged before these courts. I think she's crazy. Yeah, um, I think I that the statute could certainly be tightened, and in some cases where there's no monetization or something, perhaps something close to that would make sense, but not all content holders are Disney Corporation. There are a lot of small content holders who see their work being taken in ways that they really hate or didn't want to see it going or are morally offensive to them or are artistically <laughs> offensive to them, and they say, why can't I afford to sue them? And if you made it such that they had to overcome that presumption, the thief has more rights than the owner, and that's not. Yeah, it's where the burdens are. Yeah. Um, and that's, and that that's is huge a, in law. That is a genuine debate people are having yeah. all the time. Who, and that is, at the end of the day, and I want you to walk away with with two things from this, if nothing else. One, fair use is fuzzy. Yes. Uh, actually, we three agree things. On that. One, fair use is fuzzy. Two, just posting the text of the fair use section of the U.S. copyright law on your YouTube video literally means nothing. Please stop doing this. The phrase no, no infringement intended is just I will I will blow someone's head off and the next time I see this. It's I do a like, lot of fandom like stuff. You really need to stop. Um, you're it's giving saying. me an aneurysm. Uh, and the third thing is that copyright in the United States is an economic right. It gives you the right fundamentally to be able to make money off of your work. It is not a moral right. In Europe, their structure is, is there's a French, is the right of the author, droit d'autor, I cannot speak French, but it's the, the French have a moral rights system, mm -hmm. which entails the ability of the author to say, I am morally offended by this use of my work, therefore I can make it stop. We do not have that in the United States. Nope. For, in my opinion, and there's differences of opinion about whether this is right or not, there are certain instances, Steven Tyler just sent a cease and desist to the Orange Cheeto saying that, you know, he used... Uh, uh, he used some Aerosmith song in a, in a political rally, and Steven Tyler said, I never allow anyone to use my music without permission. Yeah, you do, actually. People use your music without permission yeah. all the time, because that's how copyright law in the United States works. What they do is they have to pay you for it, but you can't stop them. Uh, and this is a result of a whole lot of different historical factors, but basically in the United States, we think that people should pretty much be freely able to use 
work so long as you pay for them with certain limitations put on it. Um, and I think people get very easily confused and think like, well, you know, if the author objects to it, no, if the author objects, I don't really care. Um, most of the, unless you're like taking money out of their pocket, basically. And that's what the courts are considered about. Are you taking money from them in some capacity? So I think that's all the time we have. Yep. Um, thanks for coming out. Um, please pick up these thanks. stupid little flyers. I spent too much time designing. They're on the side table. Um, go read my blogs.